Welcome to Brain Science, the podcast that explores how recent discoveries in neuroscience are unraveling the mystery of how our brain makes us human. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell, and this is episode 157. Before I introduce today's guest, I want to remind you that you can find complete show notes and episode transcripts on my website at brainsciencepodcast.com. You can send me feedback at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com and leave a voicemail at speakpipe.com forward slash Doc Artemis. You can also leave feedback on our Brain Science Podcast Facebook fan page. My guest today is Dr. Donald Mackay. Dr. Mackay is an emeritus professor of psychology at UCLA and the author of a new book called Remembering What 50 Years of Research with Famous Amnesia Patient H.M. Can Teach Us About Memory and How It Works. Many of you may recall that H.M. was the patient whose case taught us the critical importance of the hippocampus in memory formation. So not surprisingly, numerous books have been written about him since he died in December 2008. That was shortly after my original interview with Dr. Brenda Milner. The reason I decided to talk with Dr. Mackay about his book, Remembering, is that he wrote about aspects of HM's case that expand its importance beyond basic memory research. Dr. Mackay met HM for the first time when he was a young graduate student back in 1966, and the results of that encounter impacted the rest of his career. Today, we will explore the evidence that the hippocampus actually plays a role in normal language and consider why this might be so. As usual, I'll be back after the interview to review the key ideas and to fill in any gaps. Finally, don't forget that if you post a review in iTunes and send me a screenshot, I will send you an Amazon gift card. Don Mackay, it's great to have you on Brain Science today. Well, thank you for inviting me onto your podcast. Now, Don, you know, there's been a lot of books written about HM since he died, and I think I've probably been sent an exam copy of almost all of them. And I also tried to re- read Suzanne Corklin's book. But I have to tell you that yours is really the first that I've actually read the whole thing because it seemed like there was something new there. So I'm really excited to talk to you about that today. My usual thing is to let my guests start out by just telling a little bit about themselves. Would you mind doing that? Oh, absolutely. I'm Canadian originally, and I have an interest in um, language that I developed from an early age uh, because uh, we lived in a small town in northern Quebec called Rouen Naranda, and it was uh, 50-50 French-English. And that uh, early experience uh, introduced me to the importance of language at a very young age. And then later on, when I went to graduate school, I went to MIT, and here was this uh, exciting linguist, Noam Chomsky, who was uh, revolutionizing the study of language and mind, that inspired me to take a deep interest in language as a as a hot topic. Psycholinguistics was just getting created at that point, and, and uh, I came to see language as very central to human memory, mind, and brain. And then also as a graduate student at MIT, I had a mentor, Hans Lukas Teuber, who was the head of the psychology department, no longer called psychology department, it's called the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. But back then it was psychology and uh, he uh, introduced me to Henry Malayasing and uh, that kindled my interest in memory, mind and brain for the rest of my life and the course of my career at UCLA. I'm now an emeritus uh, psychologist from UCLA, and um, that gave me a chance to learn how to write for a general audience, and that's how I came to 
write this book called Remembering. So what year was it that you first met Henry? I met him in 1966 when I was a graduate student at MIT. Was this after or before Brenda Milner had done her famous, you know, experiment with the mirror writing? It was after she had done it, but not, but not by much. She was still doing collaborative work and actually collaborative work at MIT in 1966. And uh, she heard me give a presentation on my very first experiment with Henry at MIT, which took place on the day I met him. We're going to come back to that in a minute, but I was just wanting to get some timing in mind, especially because I did have the honor of interviewing Dr. Milner. It was in 2008 when she was 90 years old, and I have replayed that episode a few years ago, so my my listeners, are a lot of them are familiar with it. And so I'm, I'm interested in talking about some of those experiments as we move along. But before we do, would you mind just giving us a, an overview of your book, Remembering, and emphasize how it's different from the so many other books about the subject? Well, uh, Remembering is about uh, memory, mind, and brain, and how it works. And it's uh, based on uh, 50 years of research with uh, this famous amnesic, Henry M. And it's uh, also about the implications of that research for how normal individuals can keep their memory, mind, and brain sharp as they grow older. And as for the other books that have been written about Henry's life, the main one is, uh, as you mentioned, by Suzanne Corkin, and it's called uh, Permanent Present Tense. But it's uh, very different from my book and the research that it examines and the framework that it adopts for thinking about this famous case, HM, is fundamentally different from the framework that I adopted in my 50 years of research with Henry and and in this uh, book where I am uh, describing those 50 years of research. So basically, Corkin's book starts with what I call the brain-first approach. The fundamental topic of interest is the damage that happened to Henry's brain as a result of that operation that made him amnesic back in 1953. So it goes into the whole history of the operation and how x-rays showed exactly where these fine metal tubes were inserted into his brain that suctioned out his hippocampus. And, and, uh, and then after that, all the new technologies that were developed to study the localization of brain damage to show exactly where Henry's uh, brain was damaged. So it gets very technical. There's quite a bit of jargon about different parts of the brain, but uh, none of that appears in remembering, uh, because remembering is trying to show how ordinary people can keep their merry mind and brain sharp. And, and so I focus uh, normal people first in what I call the feet-first approach rather than the brain-first approach. The feet-first approach, you look at some feat that the human brain accomplishes, like understanding language, for example, planning to um, do something in the future, or imagining some new possibility, or you know, creating some new object. The feat or task is the initial interest in my approach. And once you come to a clear understanding how a task, including in Milner's case, the mirror imaging task that you talked about, once you understand how normal people do that, only then do you ask the question, well, how does that normal process break down when you've got 
damage of particular sort, such as in the case of Henry. And so the book then is um, jargon-free, it's highly accessible and stuff. It's also very, very personal, unlike the other books that took this uh, brain-first approach, including Corkin. Throughout the book, there are what I call reflection boxes. So in the reflection box, I, I talk about how I keep my own memory, mind, and brain sharp using what I learned or expressed in a chapter. Or, so I'm illustrating what I learned about memory, mind, and brain from my research with Henry. And also remembering is um, different in, in that it's a sort of a series of detective stories where the t detective, me, is using his hippocampus to solve one mystery after another. So that, that's one of the functions of the hippocampus is to represent mysteries and to uh, solve problems. And these are different types of mysteries, scientific mysteries in the book, personal mysteries associated with Henry's behavior, for example, why he, he was perfectly normal citizen when he was at MIT. Uh, he was calm, polite, cooperative, and nonviolent. But at his home, including when he was living with his mother, and at his healthcare center after she died. He was a sporadic troublemaker. He was unpredictable and violent. He almost landed himself in jail from uh, you know, attacking another resident uh, extremely aggressively. And so why was that sort of curious difference between Henry when he was at home versus when he was at MIT? The thing that grabbed me as I was reading it, and I knew early on that I was going to want to interview you, was because you talked about all these experiments that revealed that he had a large number of language deficits. And so this was a surprise. It was something I didn't know about. And I was like, this is important, you know, and that was really what... Um, made me keep reading. I also appreciated the this is how you use it in real life um, elements to the book. But from the standpoint of what I do with this podcast, it was the surprising mysteries about his language deficit. Those were the detective stories that I was the most captured by. So let's start out by talking about your very first experiment that you did with Henry, because it really set the tone for your career for 50 years. So the, the, I was just a graduate student. I didn't know the um, story that was being developed about Henry which is that his language was perfectly normal. And uh, my mentor actually wanted me to uh, demonstrate that his language was normal, and so asked me to do an experiment that I had already done with uh, normal undergraduates uh, with Henry. It was a very simple experiment. I would present uh, ambiguous sentences one at a time and uh, told Henry or the normal people I was comparing him with, this uh, sentence has two distinct meanings. Please uh, tell me what they are. I was actually interested in the time, how quickly they could come up with the two meanings of an ambiguous sentence is like the soldier put the gasoline in the tank or where, where it could be either a military tank or a container. I was uh, expecting um, that Henry would be able to find the two meanings in just a couple of seconds. I was measuring the time. And then this person was supposed to describe the two meanings in the order that they saw them. And I would record that and write it down. Um, indicate the time for that too. Well, Henry was totally unable to do um, this even after I showed him 
what the two meanings of an ambiguous sentence were, then he was unable to repeat them. His uh, descriptions of the sentences and, and possible ambiguities in the sentence were, were completely incoherent and uh, almost incomprehensible. And so I was uh, simply astounded by this and, and uh, the sort of uh, radical contrast to what everyone, including my mentor, was expecting to be true, that he didn't have any problem in comprehending any type of sentence. So um, ambiguous sentences are unusual, but in fact, every sentence in natural language contains ambiguities that have to be resolved. And this was this was just being discovered at the time I was a graduate student. There was someone at Harvard who was trying to get a computer to understand very, very simple uh, sentences, like time flies like an arrow. You know, human beings have no difficulty saying what that sentence means. But computers were spewing out, you know, 84 different meanings for that one sentence and meanings that we, we never see. So, as you say, that was sort of a foundational experiment that led me to look at unambiguous sentences with Henry, to look at ungrammatical sentences with Henry, metaphoric uh, sentences humor in, in verbal captions of cartoons and that um, gave me the same basic story. Henry had very, very serious comprehension and production deficits relative to the normal people I would run with exactly the same task. But my reviewers, my critics, when I was trying to publish uh, this work, you know, would come up with alternate interpretations. So he's, uh, you know, forgetting one word in the sentence when he's going on to read the rest of the sentence and so on. So I, I needed to knock out that criticism. So I started looking at uh, reading sentences aloud. And so these are novel sentences, but very short and all containing familiar words. And there again, he, he would make errors in reading sentences. And um, yeah, he wouldn't be able to correct his own errors. And so I started looking at ungrammatical sentences that I created, where there would be a, a word that was incorrect within the context. And uh, yeah, he was unable to tell whether the sentences were grammatical or ungrammatical. And when he guessed, he, he said that a sentence was ungrammatical, he was uh, unable to say which word it was that made it ungrammatical. He would accept as grammatical sentences like, uh, she hurt himself. Just three words like that. She hurt himself, and he, he, he would say that that was fine, grammatical sentence. So, yeah, it was one sort of stunning deficit after another. He, he, he couldn't tell who did what to whom in a sentence. He gave him a sentence like, the water that the mother spilled surprised the young child. And you ask him, who spilled the water, the mother, the young child, or nobody? What do you think he would say to that question? The water that the mother spilled surprised the young child. The child? Yes, that's what he said. Uh, so he wasn't comprehending that structure, that uh, the mother spilled the water. And, uh, he's just going by what he intuits based on his knowledge about young children, that they do the spilling and the mother does the mopping up. <laughs> <laughs> And so uh, that same general picture emerged over and over, including the many different types of errors that he made in, in uh, uh, my tests of his language production. What was the big, most 
common feature of all of his deficits? Okay, that's a very important question. And the common feature that emerged in all of my experiments with Henry is that he had a problem creating new internal representations or memories, uh, new information, whether it was um, in comprehension or in ideas that he was trying to express. He had tremendous difficulty understanding and comprehending and planning to produce new phrases, new sentences, to describe new situations. Now, he didn't have any trouble whatsoever with familiar information. So common words or, or cliches, he had no difficulty uh, whatsoever. And uh, that's uh, an important point because um, in normal um, conversations that he would have with researchers, they would allow him to say whatever he liked. And so he, he was perfectly capable of expressing cliches and familiar phrases and stories that he uh, repeated dozens or hundreds of times in the past he would sound completely coherent. And so that reinforced people's idea that, in fact, his language production was completely normal. But in fact, when you did an experiment that then pushed him to create new ideas, to uh, describe new situations, my best experiments, these involved pictures that he then had to describe with various sorts of constraints and then his language production broke down in spectacular ways. And so, yeah, creating those novel situations that required production of novel phrases, novel sentences, that took a certain amount of ingenuity. And it was really important that these were experiments that you did with normal people so you knew what he should have been able to do. And that was critical in several different ways. You know, I would present them a picture of two people in line at a cafeteria restaurant. The woman ahead of him in line has her tray filled and the um, man behind her, her is um, saying what he wants from uh, the cafeteria server. And Henry says, I want some her. Okay, now, what was he trying to say? Well, I knew from running, you know, a large number of people of the same age as Henry at the time, and, um, as like Henry as possible, except for memory deficit, that they would say, uh, I want some of what she had. But all Henry could say is, I want some her, and that's completely ungrammatical. Some her is not English. Pronouns like her can't combine with some. It has to be what's called a noun phrase or noun. A noun phrase like some, some of what she had. So he had trouble combining concepts and uh, that's what the hippocampus does. It uh, is able to combine concepts to form new concepts. And he wasn't able to do that. I want to share a tool with you that will help you take control of your time by handling repetitive typing tasks. It's called Text Expander, and it's available for both Mac and Windows. With Text Expander's intuitive visual interface, you can create snippets containing words, phrases, and even entire documents. When I got the opportunity to include Text Expander as an advertiser on brain science, I was really excited because this is a tool I literally use every day. If you would like to get 20% off your first year of Text Expander, just go to textexpander.com forward slash podcast, and be sure to tell them that you heard about it here. That's textexpander.com forward slash podcast.
I want to talk about what this tells us about how the normal brain works. But before we do, can you talk a little bit more about the difference in his behavior when it came to high-frequency words and uncommon words? You've talked about it, but I want to emphasize it. That was a critical finding. So I can give you an example. Uh, One was, um, I did did 25 different experiments with Henry, not just on language, but many other aspects of cognition, including visual comprehension of uh, scenes. But uh, let me tell you about uh, my experiments comparing effects of aging on identical memories for Henry versus normal individuals who are as I said, matched with Henry in background, education, IQ, and age. Uh, So Henry had no problem defining what common words are. So apple, a type of fruit, for example. But uncommon words, if we asked him what lentil means, he said that lentil means area and time of. And that's very unlike normal individuals, even much older normal individuals who uh, know that lentils are a type of bean. And, uh, you know, we would show him a picture of a stethoscope and ask him to name it, and he couldn't do it. That's very unlike, you know, normal 80-year-olds can say that that's a stethoscope. So what was happening, we were showing that Aging was causing a very rapid degradation in Henry's word knowledge for rare words, but not for common words. And so that was a fundamental mystery. So we came up with a theory of what was going on there. And basically, we concluded that the hippocampus can act like a carpenter. It can build new memories just like a carpenter can build a new house. And if aging and infrequent use degrades an existing memory for a rarely encountered word like lentil, then the hippocampus can rebuild that memory when the person encounters that rare word in everyday life. And normal people do that. They relearn things that they've forgotten, uh, like an uncommon word. And that's like a carpenter, you know, replacing a broken stair in an old stairwell. Well, Henry couldn't do that. With no hippocampus, he couldn't create new memories, and he couldn't repair damage to the one. So, you know, forgotten words were gone forever, and he couldn't restore them. And, uh, yeah, um, that, uh, I think, is um, extremely important for um, normal people. In order to make new memories and keep your old memories sharp, then take care of your hippocampus and and preserve your memories in ways that Henry could not. Because you can use those uncommon words and get them sort of refreshed. Yes. So you mentioned early on, and I think I did too, the fact that people weren't very receptive to your discoveries because it didn't fit into certain assumptions. Over time, what key discoveries have sort of helped to overcome these traditional... The, I mean, the big one was that memory and language are totally separate from each other. And, and this work clearly shows that that's not true. But in order for anybody to accept your evidence, other discoveries had to happen. Would you consider mirror neurons to be the turning point or was it something else? Um, mirror neurons were one turning point. They were an important turning point because I had already created a theory that postulated mirror neurons that play a role in both perception and production. This is before Rizzolatti and others in Italy you know, showed the existence of mirror neurons in, in macaque monkeys. And so that physiological demonstration in monkeys supported this theory that I had developed that explained Henry's deficits that that were completely parallel in comprehension of language and in uh, production of language. But uh, 
the really important uh, discoveries that uh, started to change people's minds were my demonstrations of exactly parallel deficits and sparing in the realm of visual cognition that Henry was able to comprehend visual concepts that were familiar if they were presented in isolation, like a wastebasket, for example, or a window. A simple picture drawing of those things, he would be able to give the name. But if you put those things now into a novel context in a complex scene, like in a classroom filled with many, many other objects. He was at a loss. He called a wastebasket a window. And that's extremely unusual. No normal subject did anything like that. But it was the parallel with a language where he knew the common words and sentences, but he couldn't see the relation between the words when it's uh, within this novel context of a sentence. That's what convinced uh, people in Britain initially who were having the same difficulties I was having in getting their work published on perception of complex visual objects, novel objects on the part of other hippocampal uh, patients that they were studying at Cambridge University. Yeah, it's a much co a more complex uh, story than that. Uh, that's just an illustration. Right. But that brings up some important ideas. So meanwhile, as you are doing your own other research, your focus was on what's going on in normal people in terms of the use of language and also what happens as you get older. Would you talk a little bit about why if we look at, say, our memory for word knowledge, that's a lot, say, easier to study than trying to study memory using the memory for events. Could you talk a little bit about why word knowledge is a good model? Basically, if you're wanting to look at aging especially, you want to know when the information was um, learned and exactly what was learned. And um, uh, you want there to be a consistency in the use of that information after the occurrence of uh, the learning. And you don't want there to be huge individual differences between individuals in what they learn. Now, all of that was the case for uh, events, okay? People encounter uh, events at different ages and they rehearse the you talk about the events to a different extent after the occurrence of uh, learning of the event forming the memory for the event uh, all of those things make um, event memories difficult as a, a model to study in the case of memory and, and uh, forgetting but words are different. We learn uh, words at a fairly consistent time during our childhood. And uh, we use them at a rate that is uh, known. Word frequency effects have been studied since um, probably the 1890s. First uh, word frequency norms were established actually and, and only surpassed many, many decades after the 1890s. And so you know the, the history of that type of knowledge and uh, you can then have a low variability between individuals. And that's not the case for events and, and, and facts, uh, simple facts like memory for a penny, a penny, American penny, something you encounter many, many times over the course of your life. Different people have radically different memories if you ask them to draw a penny. In my particular case, I, I'm only able to 
to recall three features of a penny, that it's small and copper colored and it has the image of Abraham Lincoln. And there's 15 other features I could have recalled and that some people are able to recall, but I only recall three because of how I learned about pennies when I was extremely young. Now a coin collector would know all 15 <laughs> of those features, you know, that Lincoln's head is faced to the right and not to the left, that the Lincoln Memorial is on the other side of the coin. So yeah, tremendous individual differences in the cases of facts uh, that you don't get in the case of words. Everybody wants to remember the same thing about, you know, how to spell a word or what a word means and, and what, how it's pronounced. Etc. And that makes it uh, much easier to study, especially for aging. So tell us about how uh, normal aging affects word recall. Rarely used information, um, this means words in this case, gets um, forgotten as a function of age. Older adults forget the meaning of uncommon words. Uh, and they, you know, forget how to spell uh, irregularly spelled words, even if they're frequent in terms of uh, their use or uh, pronunciation frequency. Uh, older adults forget the irregular spelling. They can't tell whether bicycle is spelled B-I-C-Y or B-I-C-I or B-A-Y, bicycle. And eventually, in their 80s, many older adults are unable even to read the word. So yeah, there's this pattern of degradation as a function of age for uh, rarely um, used information and uh, that applies to every aspect of word knowledge. So coming back to Henry, he got tested at, I think, 71 and 73. What did you discover for him? Well, he got tested um, more than that. But, I mean, that those were some particular comparisons that you mentioned in the book. I'm sorry. Yes, and those were my experiments that I did with my postdoctoral fellow at age 71 and 73. But other people had done experiments uh, when he was younger, and we um, used exactly the same stimuli. So there's a test known as the Boston Naming Test, which involves um, pictures that people have to name, and the word names are um, quite variable in uh, frequency from very common to very low frequency, like stethoscope. So Henry, we found, was showing degradation of these aspects of word knowledge at a much younger age than the normal people who we uh, compared him with, very similar to him, except in, in having normal memory. That led us to this conclusion about the hippocampus being involved in repeated memories something that Henry couldn't do. He was having this much more rapid rate of forgetting of word knowledge than the normal people. On Brilliant Science, we often talk about the value of learning a new language, but for most of us, it can be hard to find the time. That's where Babbel comes in. It's a language learning program that you can do in convenient 10 to 15 minute chunks. It includes interactive dialogues, so you actually learn to speak the language. Another cool thing is that you can do it on your desktop or use the mobile app, and it syncs between all your devices so you can work on your new language whenever you have a few minutes. There's lots of different languages to choose from. You can try Babbel for free. Just go to babbel.com or download the Babbel app. So try it for free. That's Babbel. B-A-B-B-E-L dot com or download the app for free. Babbel, 
Speak a new language with confidence. Does this tell us that if we have a normal hippocampus, then our forgetting is going to be different than if we had an abnormal hippocampus? Which, of course, that would also be the case in a person with Alzheimer's disease. Now, the latest diagnostic technologies involve imaging and seeing that the hippocampus is an abnormal size. How does somebody know when to worry? You know when to worry when you start forgetting high-frequency words, when you don't know what a spoon is or, you know, what a chair is. That's when you need to see a neurologist. I remember hearing about the writer Iris Murdoch, who died of Alzheimer's disease. Did you read the thing about how they did word analysis of her books? And it showed that the complexity of her language went down even before she was diagnosed. Yes. And uh, yes, I I know the person who did that research uh, on Iris Murdoch. She's at Cambridge University. But uh, before that, here in the U.S., there is a famous study of nuns when they enter their profession as a nun. This uh, study had record of what the nuns had written at age 18 when they were entering the convent because they answered uh, particular questions. So they analyzed the complexity of their sentence structures at age 18 versus at age 70 when they were many, many decades older. They uh, then followed these nuns and looked at how often they got Alzheimer's disease. And it turned out that the 18-year-olds who had uh, complex sentence structures in their essays were much less likely to uh, succumb to Alzheimer's disease than other people who had um, less complex sentence structures in those essays. So. Yeah, that was an early spectacular predictor of future Alzheimer's disease. And I guess it illustrates the importance of developing as much cognitive reserve as we can. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, keep using your skills, keep learning new skills, keep active intellectually, maintain your memory, mind, and brain. Most of us, at least the people who listen to the show, are aware that the hippocampus is important for forming new memories, but I don't think until I read this book I had an appreciation at all about its its role in language. So can you take us back through your, I guess, what you call the integrated learning hypothesis, which I don't know exactly how that fits, but... How is that different from, say, other ideas about what's going on, other hypotheses? Well, the main other uh, hypothesis uh, was um, Milner's hypothesis, which is called the uh, procedural learning hypothesis. Actually, she didn't use that word procedural learning, but the basic concepts that she developed from her research in the uh, mirror tracing task were the basis for what is now called the procedural learning hypothesis. That uh, hypothesis is fundamentally different from this uh, integrated learning hypothesis. Basically, Milner concluded that Henry's procedural learning in the mirror tracing task was intact, that the hippocampus then is not involved in tasks that, that have been labeled as motor tasks or muscle movement tasks. And that's what the mirror tracing task was labeled in this brain first approach. And so the idea is that some other area of the brain outside of the hippocampus then is involved in learning muscle movement or motor tasks. Um, Because Henry seemed to be normal, uh, according to Milner, in this mirror tracing test, then she postulated that some area outside the hippocampus and various areas have been postulated. The main one is basal ganglia, 
in the midbrain is what is responsible for this learning that takes place in a mirror tracing task. And that is different from normal fact learning or event learning because it's unconscious, according to this uh, hypothesis. Well, I was able to show that all of those assumptions were wrong, that Henry's learning in the mirror tracing task was in fact impaired. If you look at the details, he took three times as long as normal individuals to learn to trace around a star with the same level of proficiency as the control individuals. And, and it took him three days for, to accomplish that feat, whereas the normal controls uh, did, you know, within a normal one hour session sort of thing. I developed this integrated learning hypothesis based on my research and the research of many others who I cite in my book. And the idea is that no, they're not sort of separate uh, learning mechanisms for conscious versus unconscious uh, learning. And not only that, but the learning occurs everywhere in the brain in the same fundamental way. That includes uh, learning based on the hippocampus as well as learning based on repetition, which is what this procedural learning hypothesis claimed, that this special unconscious learning is based on you know, repeated trials in, in some motor task. But uh, I'm saying that the basic underlying mechanism, both when the hippocampus results in very rapid learning and also when Henry as it turned out, could uh, learn through repetition. You'll not see that in any neuroscience textbook, but Henry, in fact, could learn new information by simply repetition, saying over and over and over syllables like frisbee, 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 frisbee. He could come up with a representation of that word, even though that word was never used prior to his operation. So the basic mechanism in this hypothesis is that repeatedly triggered activation of postsynaptic neurons. Okay, so you have uh, one neuron triggering activation of a second neuron. That alters the chemistry of the synapses between those neurons. In this theory, underlies both conscious and unconscious learning everywhere in the brain, regardless of the type of information that the synapse is encoding, whether it's, you know, the speech muscle procedures or word spelling or word pronunciation or word meaning, every single level of information involves this repeated activation. And the hippocampus then triggers extreme repeated activation of neurons up in the cortex for two different concepts, and that allows those concepts to be, to link to a new unit representing the conjunction of those two uh, concepts, a novel conjunction uh, and a new memory. But the underlying mechanism is this repetition. And this integrated learning hypothesis is involved in every type of learning. So this is a much more general uh, hypothesis than the procedural learning hypothesis. And it's not been proven wrong, unlike the procedural learning hypothesis, which has been proven wrong. <laughs> so the role of the hippocampus in this hypothesis is in strengthening the binding between concepts or creating the binding, because Henry couldn't do that. It's creating the binding between, well, to a new unit that represents a conjunction of already familiar units in memory. So when I first learned your name, Virginia Campbell, I had a unit in my brain representing Virginia because I know a lot of people with the name Virginia. And I had a unit in my brain representing Campbell because I, being Scottish <laughs> in origin, I knew a lot of Campbells. 
Well, I didn't know Virginia Campbell. So what my hippocampus does in this theory is to activate, super activate, and simultaneously super activate both of those already existing memories, the one for Virginia and the one for Campbell. And that super activation, extremely high rates of activation, like you know, thousand cycles per second for um, neurons, burns in a new connection uh, representing the conjunction of the two. And so I have a Virginia Campbell unit that's in my brain and that I can use and attach uh, um, all sorts of information that I learn about you. And that hypothesis has not been proven wrong. So it's still out there. <laughs> I would love to have you describe the the version of the mirror writing experiment that you did with normal people and explain what you learned from that. I just took the assumptions of the procedural learning hypothesis as explanation of Milner's uh, results. And I tested them uh, one after another. So uh, is the mirror tracing learning specific to the muscles? Well, that's easy, okay? So instead of my participants tracing with their right hand, after let's say 20 tracings of a star, for the last 10 tracings of the star, I had them switch to their other hand, their left hand, and compare that with another group that just kept using their right hand all the way through. Actually, I haven't quite described this correctly because uh, I should be talking about their dominant hand versus their non-dominant hand. <laughs> but anyway, what I found was that it was as if with their left hand, they had had 30 trials of practice and they received the same level of performance as the other group that had 30 trials with their single hand. And that indicates that it's not the muscles because the muscles of the left hand or of one hand, <laughs> whether it's dominant or non-dominant, are completely different from the muscles of the other hand and they're, they have different effects. Uh, those uh, muscles. Homologous muscles in one hand move the hand the opposite direction from the homologous muscles in the other hand. And I was able to show that it's in fact much higher conceptual level is, uh, where the learning is happening, that people are learning mirror tracing in this task involving high level conceptual rules. So with Milner's particular mirror, what it was doing was reversing up and down so that they moving their hand upward caused them to see their hand moving downward. But right and left was uh, the same, moving your hand to the right. You saw your hand moving to the right and moving to the left, you saw it moving to the left. They're learning these rules and I showed that they're learning those rules very early on in this task. And so I, I did that by simplifying the task. It turns out that stars are very, very complex um, in terms of the procedures that are involved in uh, tracing it. So in the new task that I invented, they were to trace around a square. And there the rules were very, very clear that they were learning. To trace your pencil, or, or in my case, I, I had it computerized, so to move their stylus to the left, that would cause the cursor to move to the left. And uh, the new rules that they had to learn was to move your cursor down, you had to move your hand up. And those are the rules that Henry had, had to learn to move his pencil up in the mirror that he saw, he had to move his hand down and vice versa. And I, I was able to show that they consciously knew those rules 
very early on in, in the task. And that indicated that this learning is happening at a high level and it's conscious early on. That contradicted the procedural learning hypothesis then in terms of muscles and uh, unconsciousness. Now, other people have shown using fMRI that in fact the hippocampus is involved in learning these so-called motor learning tasks. Early on, you get clear signs of hippocampal activity in um, learning the task, and then it dies down. So that's this hippocampal side of learning the task, learning those new rules, it, it, uh, is happening early in the task, but later there's just simple repetition learning without involvement of the hippocampus later in tasks like, like mirror tracing. That's why Henry wasn't as good as the normal people, why it took him three times as long as normal to achieve the same performance as normal individuals because he was just learning by this very gradual process of repeated activation without this super activation, uh, which is what the hippocampus brings in. And did you say, if I remember it correctly, the people who were in the ex experiment who had the awareness of the rules early on learned faster than the ones who didn't? Yes. Other people have replicated that. That intuitively fits personal experience. I mean, when you learn a new physical skill, you use bicycle riding as a great example in the book. I'm a tennis player, so I think about tennis. When learning a new skill, you consciously have to think about what you're doing at first, and then you pass a point where then thinking about it is counterproductive. But at the beginning, you have to be aware to learn a new skill. That's what coaches do. They're teaching you verbally how to use your muscles in this new way, what those rules are in order to be successful as a tennis player. So the bottom line is our, our hippocampus is even more important than we thought. <laughs> yes, my research is all about that. So the hippocampus is extremely important for planning and imagining, even important for understanding our visual world. And there's no important aspect of cognition that is not improved through involvement of the hippocampus. That even applies to consciousness. When Alan Castell was on a few months ago, he talked about the evidence that walking actually helps improve the volume of your hippocampus. So we really want to keep our hippocampus healthy. And I love the way you incorporate those principles into practical things to do in our everyday life, even though we haven't really focused that much about that. But as a physician, I have to reflect on the fact that this information makes some of the behavior of dementia patients make a lot more sense. You know, like why they can't learn anything new. Well, of course, dementia patients are more complex than Henry. They have problems in the cortex. But say the conscious awareness changes or appears to diminish, for example. Yes, and that's part of my story in the book. I have a whole chapter on consciousness. But just to um, pick up again Alan Castell's very important point about exercise, Exercise tunes up every cell in your body, billions, many, many trillions of cells, but exercise has very, very special effects on the brain. There's been clear demonstration that exercise causes release of an important hormone by the name of BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, and uh, yeah, that causes the growth of dendrites that are critical in forming new connections and in creating new memories, or as I like to call them, internal representations because of people's association 
between uh, memory and fact learning. And memory is much, much more general uh, than that, but it clearly uh, exercises um, sort of miracle, miracle medicine um, applies, especially to the brain, but also to all aspects of our bodily function, including digestion, for example, uh, not to mention sleep and many other aspects. Yeah, one of my early guests was Dr. John Rady, and he calls BDNF miracle grow for the brain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it is. And that's for all ages. So, Don, is there anything else that you'd like to share before we close out for the day? Yeah, I would have uh, wanted to uh, talk about the importance of Henry's desire to help others. That was uh, what made him famous, basically. Scientists at MIT, including myself, promised him that uh, by participating in our experiments on his memory, mind, and brain, he would be helping others. And that's what drove him to participate in thousands and thousands of experiments. He became the most uh, experimented upon human history person in, in the history of the planet. If he hadn't had that desire to help others, namely us scientists, he would have probably been exiled to some back ward of a psychiatric unit. And uh, yeah, it would have destroyed him. As it was, at MIT, he was able to overcome obvious depression and anxiety about his condition because he was helping others and creating this legacy of you know, advancing uh, world knowledge. That made all the difference to him personally. He almost ended up in jail, but knowing that he was uh, helping others helped him modulate his depression and anxiety and aggression. So he helped himself by helping others and helping the world by advancing world knowledge. So every time we learn a new lesson, we are in a way honoring his legacy because that's the legacy that he clung to. And it shows also, I mean, something that he has in common with almost every one of us is the the profound human need to make meaning out of our lives. And he found a way despite his limitations, and that's something to really honor. Yes, and you talked about successful aging. That's an extremely critical factor to keep active, keep finding purpose to your life. Your purpose is going to change based on your skills and your knowledge, but having that purpose is extremely important for your well-being. So he's a role model of how to do that despite huge, huge obstacles. Exactly. Uh, and you can find purpose despite extreme deficits. And us older people, myself included, have a tremendous thing going for us, which is an intact hippocampus, uh, which is a structure that actually creates new neurons well into our older age, into our 70s and 80s. And, and that is uh, a surprising feature of the hippocampus that's not found in other areas of the nervous system. Other types of nerves are not regrown when they're damaged, when they're damaged, it's gone forever and, and no restoration. But yeah, we've got this intact and wonderful hippocampus that's performing this miracle as we grow um, older and uh, it gives us opportunity to create new meaning for as long as we live. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today, Don. My pleasure. <laughs> Thanks, Ginger. I want to thank Dr. Donald Mackay for taking the time to talk with me. I highly recommend his new book, Remembering What 50 Years of Research with Famous Amnesia Patient H.M. Can Teach Us About Memory and How It Works. <laughs> 
it's appropriate to listeners of all backgrounds. As I mentioned in my introduction, what drew me to this book was the opportunity to learn some important new things about the hippocampus. This book is not a rehash of the stories about HM that have appeared in textbooks and magazine articles for decades. There's no substitute for reading this book yourself to get the full picture, but I'm going to highlight a few key takeaway ideas. I'm going to start by reviewing a list of the language deficits that Dr. Mackay and his colleagues discovered. For each deficit, the method was to compare Henry's results to those of normal age-matched adults. Several experiments had to be adapted to remove any potential confounds due to memory elements. The first experiment was done in 1966, and the results were totally unexpected. Mackay asked Henry to interpret several ambiguous sentences, which he was totally unable to do. Mackay describes this experiment in great detail in his book, Remembering. And one point that he didn't mention today was that the normal test subjects were able to do this task easily. So before he encountered Henry, one of the most interesting aspects that he discovered was that most people had this sort of aha moment right before they detected the second meaning in the ambiguous sentence. He never observed this with Henry because Henry never detected a second meaning. Now, this finding that he couldn't understand ambiguous sentences went against everyone's expectations at the time because they thought his language was totally normal. So it was put aside as something of an anomaly. Mackay himself went on to study both memory and language at UCLA, and he eventually also studied the effects of aging. It was many years later when Mackay came up with an hypothesis to explain these surprising results. His hypothesis is based on extensive experiments, both with normal subjects and with Henry. So let's consider some of Henry's other deficits. One was that he had trouble reading aloud. And he made a lot of uncorrected errors and mispronounced rarely used words like pedestrian. He was also unable to perform what's known as the constrained picture description task. In 1983, his word knowledge was tested as normal, but by 1997, it had declined significantly, much more than would be predicted based on age. Two years later, it was even worse. Besides this, he had problems with the Boston naming test. He had problems with spelling. Henry was able to recognize familiar words in isolation, but he couldn't read them in a sentence. He also couldn't tell the difference between grammatical and ungrammatical sentences. Henry couldn't recognize unfamiliar shapes in the hidden figures test. He also couldn't understand metaphors. One strange thing was that he could not tell who was doing what to whom in a sentence, and he couldn't use pronouns correctly. Most striking, I think, is this repeated thing that he was never rarely able to detect or correct his errors on any of these tests. I want to revisit the mirror drawing test for a moment. This was the famous test done by Brenda Milner that's usually interpreted as meaning that procedural memory doesn't require the hippocampus, since Henry was actually able to learn this task. First, it should be noted that it took Henry much longer to master this task than it did normal controls. Also, when Mackay had normal people perform a simplified version of this test, he discovered something else that was really interesting. The simplified version involved tracing a square, which meant that when the person was tracing up or down, they would draw in the expected direction. The only rules that they needed to learn was that if you wanted to go right in the mirror, you had to draw to the left, and if you wanted to go to the left, you had to move your hand to the right. So here's the part that he didn't have time to share with us. Early on in the experiment, and this of the normals, many of the subjects were consciously aware of following these rules. Being aware was a good predictor of faster mastery of the task. 
However, after many trials, subjects seemed to perform automatically, and when asked, they were no longer aware of these rules. This is really important because it implies that early on in procedural learning, conscious awareness is not only present, but important. Mackay gives the example of if you were learning how to ride a bike and you broke it down into explicit rules to learn how to ride a bike that had to do with how you push on the pedals and whatnot, after a while you would no longer remember these rules. And this fits my experience, probably yours, I think, about learning tennis since that's what I do. But anything time you're learning something new, you have to be consciously aware of how you're doing it at first until it becomes automatic. This also gives us a valuable clue as to why Henry took longer to learn this task, even though he did learn it. Based on the results of 25 experiments with Henry, Mackay and his colleagues hypothesized that Henry was unable to form new representations. That's why he couldn't combine familiar words into new sentences. Now, this would probably have extended to being able to perform a procedural rule to follow while learning mirror drawing. So Henry's slowness in learning the task was not just because he didn't remember it from day to day. Normal people didn't even take days to learn it. They mastered it in a few hours. Before we briefly talk about Dr. Mackay's integrated learning theory, I want to mention one other significant piece of evidence that we didn't discuss in the interview. In 1970, another graduate student named William Morrison Wilson recorded an extensive interview with Henry. Fortunately, he also transcribed the interview and made it available for other scientists to study. The results are discussed in great detail in remembering because they cooperate the other experimental results. Not only does Henry demonstrate the inability to communicate clearly, but he repeatedly demonstrated some of the problems that were uncovered experimentally. For example, he rarely, if ever, detects or corrects his speech errors. This is very abnormal because when a normal person misspeaks, they usually hear it and correct it. Throughout the interview, Henry says things that make no sense, but when he's asked what he means, he's never able to give an adequate answer. The Morrison wilson interview also demonstrates one thing that might seem surprising. Henry was able to keep track of the topic of conversation for a surprisingly long time. He could even return to a topic that hadn't been discussed for several minutes. This brings up a seldom mentioned fact, which is that his hippocampi were not totally destroyed. Only about half, half of each was spared. So based on the, his deficits, it appears that the hippocampus is essential for binding words together into new sentences and new ideas. But there was one kind of binding that he was still able to do. He was able to learn proper names, like John F. Kennedy or Martin Luther King, although it did take a lot of repetition. This was in contrast to his total inability to use pronouns correctly, which might be why when he was doing the picture description test, he often gave people made-up proper names, and they always had the correct gender. Another key idea that I want to emphasize is that when Henry got older, he demonstrated accelerated deficits, such as rapidly declining word knowledge. Throughout his book, Mackay emphasizes that during healthy aging, we are able to use our hippocampus to essentially relearn forgotten information. Obviously, Henry couldn't do that, and neither can people with Alzheimer's disease. So as I was reading about Henry's deficits, I found myself reflecting on some aspects of Alzheimer's disease that make more sense when we realize that the hippocampus appears to be essential for the normal use of language. For example, people with Alzheimer's disease also have trouble understanding metaphors, and their use of language becomes very impoverished. During the interview, Dr. Mackay explained why he thinks the procedural learning hypothesis fails to fit all the data. So I want to briefly review what he calls an integrated learning hypothesis. The key idea is that the hippocampus contains binding mechanisms that activate cortical neurons, 
creating novel combinations of neurons, i.e. new memories. When the hippocampus fires, it causes a prolonged, intense firing of these neurons, which makes them more likely to fire together in the future. This is called an integrated learning hypothesis because it proposes that all sorts of learning follows the same course, which is to say that repeated neural activation underlies all learning, whether it's fast or slow. The role of the hippocampus is to speed up learning. That's why when someone is learning a new skill, the hippocampus fires. It also explains why Henry was only able to learn very slowly. It's unfortunate that Dr. Mackay was not allowed to study Henry during the last 10 years of his life because I find myself wondering if Henry would have even been able to do the mirror writing task after that amount of time. I have this feeling it would not have been like, you know, you never forget to learn how to ride a bike, but we'll never know. If you want to learn more about the details of the various experiments, I highly recommend reading the book Remembering. There's also an extensive bibliography if you want to read the published results. As I mentioned before, one challenge was to eliminate potential effects that were actually due to memory. And in the book, he describes how several standard experiments were redesigned or adapted to accomplish this. An important element of this story is the fact that Mackay's findings were not always well received. Naturally, he gives his subjective account of these events, but it should be noted that although science strives to be self-correcting, it is done by human beings who are prone to the same cognitive biases as non-scientists. Although patients with pure hippocampal lesions are rare, I hope that there will be a move to attempt to replicate some of Mackay's experiments. If you find yourself inclined to automatically reject his findings, I encourage you to read the book for yourself and then to look up the primary sources. One of the ironies of human memory is that forgetting is a normal part of the process. We've come to appreciate that the hippocampus is an important gatekeeper for determining what we remember, but Henry's story expands its role tremendously. A healthy hippocampus not only allows us to relearn seldom used words and facts, but it appears to be essential for language comprehension and creativity. As always, don't forget you can find complete show notes and episode transcripts at brainsciencepodcast.com. While you're there, you can sign up for our free newsletter so that you can get these show notes every month automatically. You can send me feedback at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com, leave voice feedback at speakpipe.com forward slash doc artemis, and you can also post your ideas and feedback on our Facebook fan page. Finally, don't forget, send me a screenshot of your iTunes review so that I can send you an Amazon gift certificate. Next month, I hope to interview philosopher Patricia Churchland about her new book, Conscience. But in the meantime, I hope you will check out my other podcasts, Books and Ideas and Grain Rainbows. Thanks again for listening. Brain Science is copyright 2019 to Virginia Campbell, MD. You can copy this episode to share it with others, but for any other uses or derivatives, please contact me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. The new theme music for the Brain Science Podcast is Mindfire by Tony Catraccia. You can find his work at syncopationnow.com.